Hello, everyone. I'm Joseph Rickard from our studio and our consortium. Welcome to the COVID-19 Data Forum webinar. This is the first event in what will be an ongoing series of conversations to examine issues around the data required for medical professionals and public health officials to make informed decisions about the COVID-19 pandemic. In this discussion and future discussions, we hope to assess uh, the data that's currently available, identify what's missing, recommend best practices uh, for quality, accessibility, sharing, and privacy. Today we have four speakers, Allison Hill, Brian Hafen, Orson Iden, and Noam Ross. All of our speakers are senior researchers who individually have significant experience in data acquisition, data curation, and modeling, and whose collective experience covers a wide range of perspectives. So after some opening remarks by Michael Kane of uh, Yale University's Department of Biostatistics, each of our speakers will have 15 minutes to make their presentations. We'll have a Q&A session after the final speaker. So please write your questions uh, using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And now let's start. Please welcome Dr. Michael Kane. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Michael Kane. Like Joe said, I'm an assistant professor of biostatistics at Yale University and welcome to the COVID-19 Data Forum. This is the first in a series focusing on data-related aspects of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has challenged virology and epi epidemiology as well as our policies regarding outbreak response. The pandemic's severity rose abruptly and especially in the beginning, we were contending with tremendous uncertainty with respect to the disease and its transmission. As a result, we did not have a lot of time to plan proper studies, put, put data management infrastructure in place, or to coordinate the unified data collection protocols. A lot of the data collection resources we created are ad hoc, and it's important to realize that many of these sources are collected by healthcare workers who are working very long hours and exposing themselves and the people around them to potential infection so that we can do things like estimate how many beds or ventilators are going to be needed by a given hospital in the next week. These and other related data sources like them provide a basis for which we understand the disease and its spread. At the same time, we need to acknowledge the limitations for the data we have. For example, we know there are regional differences in how cases and deaths are counted for COVID-19. This can make fair comparisons across regions difficult and identifying these differences early in the data collection and validation process can prevent inappropriate comparisons that could eventually result in bad policy decisions. We need to allow researchers to use these data and disseminate them in a way that is open while maintaining individual privacy. The model of collecting data and releasing it years later only after it has been mined for all possible publications only slows our collective response to the outbreak. Data collection and validation often requires intellectual efforts and, that and, and those efforts themselves should be properly incentivized. This forum was put together to embrace these challenges and focus on the acquisition, validation, standardization, normalization, harmonization, and dissemination of COVID-19 data. These steps are often overlooked and even marginalized in favor of the more easily publicized results of the models relying on them. However, I think everyone here realizes that the data preparation and exploration is where we spend a lot, if not the majority of our effort. And without a, a properly cleaned and validated data set, there's no reason to believe models derived from these data or put any stock in the decisions these models inform. So the goal today is to, is to shine a spotlight on the process of creating high quality COVID-19 data sets so that they can be explored, visualized, and modeled to better understand the disease, its outbreak, and to inform better decisions for prevention and treatment. Our speakers are expert practitioners in these areas, and we're eager to hear about their experiences and insights and to find out about the data resources that are available. And with that, I'll hand it back to Joe. Thank you, Michael. Okay, our first speaker will be Dr. Allison Hill. Allison is a mathematical biologist who develops models to help predict, understand, 
and control the spread of infectious diseases. She is currently the John Harvard Distinguished Science Fellow at Harvard University. And until the coronavirus outbreak, she was focused on HIV AIDS and drug resistant infections. So please give your best Zoom welcome to Allison Hill. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so today, I'm going to be telling you a bit about, from the point of view, someone working on modeling COVID-19 spread and control, um, about the data needs and challenges as I see them. So I always like to start off my COVID talks with just this like big picture summary of the epidemic, which I know you're all familiar with, but I just think it's really important to remind ourselves of some very sobering facts about this outbreak. So that a virus we had never heard of five months ago has now infected at least four and a half million people around the world um, in probably every single country. Um, and based on my estimates, probably already is going to be within the top five viral causes of death worldwide this year, even just counting the last few months. So really, uh, this is the crisis of our time. So um, oops, I think, as Joe mentioned, in my, my day job, I do work on infectious disease modeling. But before this outbreak, I focused um, on HIV, drug resistant infections. Um, but many of the principles behind modeling infectious diseases are something that um, we learn and apply and can be um, put into use of many different scenarios. So um, like many other people in my field, uh, as soon as this outbreak began, there was a really big demand for infectious disease modeling expertise and somehow ended up that now I'm almost exclusively focused on working on coronavirus modeling. Um, and one of the things that we've worked on is that in early March, we released uh, an online modeling application that allows users to simulate COVID dynamics from their browser and compare the effects of differing parameters, um, or adding interventions, comparing these to healthcare capacity. Um, it's open source and can be adapted for a lot of different purposes um, and has been used uh, as the foundation of models that are, have been created for a lot of different purposes by regional health departments or other government agencies or consultants, educators, or for other web applications. And so kind of based on this, we've ended up working on a lot of different projects with many different agencies, um, all trying to answer the same questions about really what is going to happen with COVID and how, how can we control this outbreak. So I just wanted to highlight like what I see of some of the main roles that modeling has or can play um, in the COVID-19 epidemic. So maybe even the simplest thing is just making really short term predictions. So many people just intuitively uh, don't have the best grasp of the concept of exponential growth and even really simple models that highlight that fact and how quickly infections can spread. I think it's very helpful early in the outbreak to make people realize how quickly things could change. Um, I think they played a big role in highlighting the risk of healthcare capacity overflow if the epidemic was allowed to spread unchecked without um, really severe interventions. Uh, models obviously were very instrumental in getting across this idea of flattening the curve, which has now um, kind of just become a word that everyone is familiar with. I think, as I said, they motivated this implementation of strong interventions, kind of both qualitatively and quantitatively by saying really how much do we need to reduce spread to keep, keep our healthcare system under capacity. Um, models, um, when designed right and when kind of properly accounting for all the uncertainty can be used to project the course of the epidemic kind of beyond this initial phase um, into the summer, fall, and even subsequent seasons. Um, they've been used to estimate the impact of seasonality and whether that's going to play a big role in this outbreak. Um, and of course, kind of trying to estimate the total burden of infection and how that relates to kind of what we're seeing in our reported cases versus what might really be there. So I wanted to go through some of the kind of ingredients of models for COVID-19. And then for each of these ingredients, I'm going to talk a little bit about what type of information we need to make informative models um, kind of focusing on each particular part. So one important part of any disease model and particularly infectious disease models is having a good idea of the clinical course of the infection. So from that I mean what happens between when someone goes from being susceptible to getting infected, um, so how long does it take them uh, until they actually start showing symptoms, being infectious to other people, and then what are different stages of infection they pass through um, 
types. For example, um, do people have asymptomatic infection? Do they develop certain types of symptoms? How long do those last? Um, do people recover or do some people eventually develop more severe infection that might require hospitalization, ICU level care, and what percent of people end up dying? Um, all of these components are the, the first ingredient that goes into an infectious disease model. So we can think about how individuals in the population um, might transition between these different states and the time scale in which that happens. Another really important ingredient is uh, transmission networks. So uh, what this means is trying to understand who transmits to whom, who can transmit to whom, and who did transmit to whom. And obviously there's a lot of unknown information in these transmission networks, and this is really one of the, the most difficult parts of infectious disease modeling. So I'll talk more about what, what we know and don't know there. Um, looking at healthcare resources that are available has been a big part of modeling COVID-19 um, in terms of what, what do we have available in our healthcare system, um, how does that depend on, on where you are, and how does that relate to what resources we might need kind of depending on um, who progresses to which stage of infection. Then of course another part of models is looking at interventions. Um, Obviously, there's a huge diversity of different types of interventions, but trying to use models to say um, which interventions might work um, better than others, how strong do these need to be, how long do they need to be implemented for, um, can we estimate how efficacious they are retrospectively, um, that's another big ingredient um, of models for infectious disease outbreaks. So uh, what are the data needs um, kind of for each of these different categories of things that go into COVID-19 models? So maybe focusing first on the kind of clinical course of infection. So how do we really parameterize a model to take these things into account? So the things that are needed here are understanding the duration of each stage of infection and its variance, the probability of progressing to different stages, how many infections might be asymptomatic versus symptomatic, um, and the infectiousness at each of these different stages of infection, and also how it might relate to the viral load that we could detect in someone to their age, et cetera. So I think the gold standard to get this type of information is doing really um, detailed and large scale cohort studies, meaning there's a group of individuals who are followed throughout their infection um, through the whole course. Um, also having contact tracing studies, meaning people who have been exposed to someone who was infectious um, are all surveyed and tracked and kind of see, to see if they develop infection or not so that people um, can really be followed from the very beginning of, of time and that you might be catching asymptomatic people as well who might not naturally present on their own to hospitals. And of course, universal and centralized reporting. Um, all of that information makes it much easier to back out these type of information. Um, but of course, we don't have this type of information in many settings, including in this in this country. So we're missing a lot of information on even this like basic first ingredient of models and that type of uncertainty um, it is problematic for everything else that goes through. So I think we have good estimates of these quantities from some detailed studies that have come from earlier in the outbreak, um, but more systematic measurements of these kind um, is really needed. And it's very difficult to estimate all of these quantities just from kind of population level data. With individual level data, um, it's much it's much more reliable way of getting these things. So then um, the second component here uh, that I mentioned, these transmission networks. So this kind of means two different things. One is like the potential transmission network as in who what, is it theoretically possible that I would be able to spread to if I was infected? And then also kind of a realized network, like who did spread to whom over the course of the outbreak? Um, so this is often uh, the hardest part to get for infectious disease models. And there's been lots of advancements here, but there's still lots of unknown, particularly for this infection. So we want to understand you know, who contacts whom you know, where they contact each other for how long and how often. We want to understand which type of contacts are most risky. Um, is it related to physical proximity, whether it's indoors or outdoors, the duration of that contact, um, kind of indirect contact being uh, touching same surfaces at different times or at similar times. 
um, we want to know what setting is most important for transmission. So even like how important is transmission within households versus at work um, versus visiting common retail spaces. Um, and of course, you know, that the answer to that question might depend on whether it's before or after an intervention, might depend on the location, age, et cetera. Of course, how important is transmission in hospitals? How much is that contributing spread? These are all really important questions for making good models. I think it's not clear what the gold standard is. In this case, I think some very good ways of measuring such things are we call contact surveys, where we ask people lots of questions about who they interacted with in a given period. Um, proximity tracking, um, if you know, able to be done, um, sort of dealing with all the privacy concerns is a great way to try to understand um, contact between individuals, contact tracing in the epidemiological sense, meaning kind of retrospectively, if someone is diagnosed, finding out who they came in contact with. Um, and then genetic epidemiology, where by comparing the sequences, the genetic sequences of viruses between individuals, you can try to trace back um, who the virus jumped between. There's many challenges for these type of estimations, including, of course, privacy, tremendous resources needed, infrastructure for reporting, these type of things, um, and, and much more. So um, one of the unique features of COVID, of course, is that a high fraction of people require hospitalization and ICU care. And so particularly early on in the epidemic, but you know, should still be now, a big part of modeling is understanding these resources and what we have and what we might need. So things that we need to make good projections here, understanding, like, like I said, when I talked about the clinical model, um, what percent of cases require different levels of care, how that depends on age and comorbidities. Uh, we want to understand kind of what capacity the healthcare system has for baseline and, and with surge capacity, providing particular resources, but also for other things outside of the hospital, like personal protective wear for the everyday public. We want to understand this at a geographic scale, could depend sort of in a very detailed way on whether you're in a city or a rural area, and particularly this is important in uh, low income countries. Um, and we want to also understand how people access care and the impact of COVID on non COVID related health concerns. I think a gold standard for this um, is you know, probably national databases that track in detail all of these medical resources and where they are, how they can be mobilized, of course, real-time reporting of resource utilization. But, you know, in general, we don't really have these things. So the challenge here is kind of finding and compiling and standardizing alternative data sources to estimate um, these type of numbers. Then, of course, um, looking at interventions. And here, when I say interventions, I'm meaning um, what we tend to call non-pharmaceutical interventions. So I'm not talking about like giving people, you know, drug treatments or vaccines for COVID. We don't really have anything effective there yet. So I'm um, talking about anything from mask wearing to isolating cases to quarantine, school closures, closing um, retail establishments, having work from home policies, stay at home policies, complete lockdown, all of these types of things that have been implemented sort of to some extent in, in many places around the world. So um, the questions that come up here are like, what is the evidence base for these interventions? Um, even tracking which interventions were implemented when and where in some standardized way would be very helpful. Um, the big unknown is understanding how much interventions reduce contacts that are relevant to transmission, um, what level of adherence people in the general population have to these interventions, how that varies spatially and temporally, and then are these interventions working and like which ones are working. So in this case, I think, of, of course, a gold standard would be like a randomized control trial of particular interventions. And of course, like we can never do that. So um, automatically, there's many difficulties in understanding a lot of these questions. Um, surveys can be very useful um, in understanding how people's behavior is actually changing. And everything that I talked about related to transmission networks is also useful here, because if we can track how the virus is spreading and how that changes before and after interventions, that helps us understand what's working. Um, so the challenge here um, is kind of relating, if we have to use other data sources to try to estimate 
what an intervention is doing. For example, looking at how much mobility is changing. How do we actually relate those alternative data sources to something that we put into a model in terms of what percent of transmission is reduced? Um, and so that's, that's, I think, the big challenge with trying to understand interventions. So just wanted to quickly say that, of course, there is some data that we have a lot of, and this is like reporting of cases um, and deaths on many different databases. The pros of this are that it's really easily accessible um, and it's centralized sources, but there's many cons to this type of underreported population level data, which does not have individual information um, and is not really catching everyone. So that's all I have for now. Excited to hear from the other speakers. Just wanted to say thanks to um, many um, others in my group and collaborators at other universities who I've thought a lot about COVID things with over the past few months. And of course, to our funding sources who have been very flexible in allowing us the time to work on these problems. Um, and I'll be excited to take your questions after all the speakers talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. So next up is Ryan Hafen. Ryan is a data scientist working as an independent consultant, a consultant with the Priva Group, and an adjunct assistant professor at Purdue University. In his work, Ryan focuses on tools, methodology, and applications in exploratory analysis, visualization, computational statistics, statistical modeling, and machine learning. So please welcome Dr. Haven. All right. Uh Thank you. Um, just making sure I'm unmuted. Uh, great. So um, thanks for the, for the introduction, Joe. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about COVID-19 case count data uh, for multiple open sources. And um, my slides uh, are available online. There's some detail in the slides I probably won't get into in the talk, so feel free to um, look at these at your own leisure. Uh, for a little bit of context, uh, this work has been joint um, with the Epidemic Intelligence from Open Sources Project, which is managed by the World Health Organization. Um, as well as uh, in conjunction with a large global health nonprofit based here in the state of Washington, uh, where I live. Um, and this group does a lot of things, and I've been working on a number of things with them, but I think uh, in an interest of this being um, kind of the first uh, of these series about COVID-19 data, it would make most sense to focus on case counts. Um, and we heard, uh, just, just heard a little bit about case counts. Um, and uh, so, and, and you're probably, you know, if you've been following COVID-19 at, at all, you, you're probably very familiar with these. Most of the thousands of uh, dashboards and visualizations that you'll find out there rely on case count data. Um, the EIOS in particular is interested in case count data, providing that to their um, public health intelligence analysts um, to help them both quickly understand the trajectories um, as well as uh, discrepancies between different data sources. Um, it's, it's important, as we've heard, to understand um, limitations of different data sources and, and just have a better feel for, um, for what's going on in the data. Uh, so th that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about. Uh, and I, I want to point out some of the sources that we have been using uh, at the global level, uh, I think the most well-known source is, uh, is data published by Johns Hopkins. Um, there's also European CDC, WHO, and even uh, uh, news sites, uh, you know, like Worldometer, which is kind of an obscure news site, but surprisingly very up-to-date and actually updating data by the minute with sources that, that um, we've been identified as you know, this and a few other news sites have been identified as places where um, we can get quick information to, to compare uh, with, with other sources of information. Um, within the United States, some sources include, again, Johns Hopkins, New York Times, USA Facts, and of course there are more than, than what I'm showing here. Um, but there's some links to those uh, for people who are interested. And with this being a, a forum 
mostly around data, I think it's worth spending a few minutes. I, I could spend this entire talk talking about uh, data standards, uh, especially as it relates to open data communities. Um, I'm just going to briefly touch on a few things. And, and a lot of this has come up through the experience of pulling data from multiple sources and just getting a feel for the breadth of different ways people uh, decide to publish data. Um, and, you know, when you think about standards, uh, when you're talking about open data communities and people choosing on their own to publish data, uh, a lot of times not much thought is given to standards. And even when it is, people have, everyone has a different idea of what, what standards should be. I'll give you some ideas in this talk of what I think. Um, but of course, everyone, you know, everyone has, has different uh, opinions. But also there's often little incentive to adhere to someone else's standard. If you have data in a format that you already are analyzing, you have code or you have an app that uses that data format, um, why would you want to take the time to conform to someone else's standard, right? But I think regardless of all this, uh, we should at least think about what are best practices uh, for, for sharing data. And I'm going to start um, with what I'm going to call an example of not best practices, but bearable practices. Um, and I'm going to focus on the data published by Johns Hopkins. And this is, you know, as I mentioned, the most widely used and cited source of data. So I, I, I hope it's fair to just <clears throat> pick on them a little bit. Um, but first, I do want to say um, they're, they're, th th uh, th they have done a really great job of getting data out there early and often. Um, and they've succeeded in making it very accessible, you know, to CSV you can go get on GitHub. Um, but there are a few issues that I have with, with the way this data is published. And I just wanna maybe tactfully, hopefully tactfully go over a few of those issues because I think it brings up some good points in discussion. Um, like I said, I could talk a lot more about this, but, but I'm just going to, to highlight a few things. Uh, first of all, the data is published in a wide format, so every date gets a new column. Um, and that's really not amenable to analysis. I don't um, know many people or anyone who analyzes data in wide format. Typically, you need to pivot that into a, a, a long uh, format. Um, also, it's not very amenable to version control every time you update. Uh, your data, every row of your data changes. And so it's hard to see what, what's um, new. Uh, the date format, uh, I really, uh, you know, everybody should use the ISO 8601 date format. Uh, this is an ambiguous format, uh, difficult to parse. Someone could make a mistake parsing it. Um, also, country names are used as a geographic identifier. They do have a lookup table that you can then merge this to geographic codes, but things change, you know, you're just introducing more chance for errors. Um, also, you'll notice for Australia, for example, they report data at the um, territory or state level, whereas for other countries, it's not broken down in that way. And ideally, I think you should have a separate file at the country level versus the state, uh, uh, the state level. And they also have a different file for each variable. This is for cases. They have another file for deaths, another file for recovered. Um, ideally, again, this should be a tidy format, one column per variable, all in the same file with rows for each date and country. Um, one other thing I just want to quickly call out is the terms of use uh, and license is an important thing to think about when you're publishing open data. Um, I'm not a lawyer or an expert in the area of data licenses, so I won't try to make too strong of a statement here. But I think when you have a non-standard and um, terms that are too restrictive, that really can impede the progress of, of science. Um, you know, someone could read these terms in a way such that anyone who's using this data is violating the terms of use because they're redistributing it in some form or another, right? Um, so I think thinking about licenses is an important consideration. 
Uh, now to pivot to an example of best practices, uh, going to the data published by New York Times, um, they kind of hit on all those things that I just mentioned. They publish their data in a tidy format, a column for cases, a column for deaths, rows for uh, each date. And um, here we're looking at uh, states. And um, they're using a standard geocode mechanism to identify the states. Um, they put state and county level data in separate files, and they're using a license that um, is uh, coextensive with Creative Commons uh, 4.0 International. Now, like I said, I don't want to I don't want to belabor this too much. Um, and you might think some of these issues aren't that big of a deal. I can just transform it, right? But um, you know, so reading in this New York Times data and getting it into a form that I can work with is a matter of a few lines of code where I'm just renaming variables. Um, whereas the Johns Hopkins data, we're talking over 100 lines of code to read multiple files, pivot them, join them, resolve uh, geographic entities, aggregate to the different levels of geographic resolution. Um, and it's not just about my efficiency. Uh, it's about the chance of introducing errors, as well as, you know, there's hundreds if not thousands of other people pulling this data and having to do the same transformations. Um, a lot of, you know, kind of uh, collective efficiency and accuracy uh, potential issues going on there. And so I think the more fluid, open and accurate we can be with data, especially in an event like this, the better. Um, with that, I, I do wanna just talk for a minute on what uh, I have been doing with, with this EIOS group. Um, and really it's just been pulling data from sources uh, and uh, providing their analysts with tools such that um, they can you know, really get a feel for what's going on in, in, in the data. And so we've been pulling from the sources I mentioned, uh, rolling up counts at different levels of geographic aggregation and computing statistics of, of interest. Um, and I do want to mention that what I've been working on with this group has been used uh, privately by, by their analysts for uh, since, since February, uh, but in, the, uh, in any day now was going to be public. And so I can share that link when it's public, but out of respect for it not being public yet, I'm going to show an example uh, using US data that's a similar approach to what I've done with this group. Um, just not at the global level. And so in addition to pulling data, um, and now at the US level, I'm pulling from Johns Hopkins, New York Times, and USA Facts, uh, we provide a set of visualizations for each geographic entity that the user can interact with, such as you know, cumulative cases over time, new cases aggregated either daily or weekly, um, new deaths, and um, case fatality uh, rate. Um, and after providing them with these visualizations, we put them into a tool um, called Trelliscope. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Trelliscope, it, it, it's a, an R package that I've developed um, that actually turned out to be exactly what they had in mind for wanting to interact with case counts. So it ended up being a nice fit that I was working with them. Um, and so we can throw these case counts in uh, to this tool called Trelliscope. Uh, and there's a link here um, I'll just give you a, a feel for what this looks like real quickly. Um, so with, and, and this is, you know, you can go visit this URL and, and, and explore it your own leisure as well. This is just one of another many uh, COVID-19 visualizations. Um, but we have things at the state and county level, so I can click on states here. And it's going to pull up these visualizations by default ordered by um, uh, current number of cases from high to low. So New York shows up first, followed by New Jersey. And I can kind of, you know, page through these visualizations and get a feel. You know, most of the sources agree in the US. There's a, a much bigger difference as you look at things globally. Uh, but you'll see, for example, Johns Hopkins is, is quite different in Rhode Island. Um, but I can also toggle these visualizations to say, I want to look at new cases 
and maybe I want to switch to weekly. Um, and I can see how, you know, in, in New York cases are going down. Again, of course, there's the caveat that, you know, testing rates are changing over time and, and, and all of those kind of things. Um, but there's different views here where I can say, I want to order by weekly percent change in deaths, um, weekly percent change in cases, where I can see South Dakota has had a big, you know, uptick. Um, there's all kinds of kind of default ways you can you can view things, but you can also go in. There's controls that allow you to um, uh, do further filtering and say, I only want to look at um, uh, states where the current um, uh, number of deaths is at least 50 or something like that, right? And so there's all kinds of ways that you can you can interact here. Another thing that you can do is you know if you're interested in say um let's say alabama you can actually click a link and go in um, and look at counties within alabama or i can also look at all counties um, and uh, so here i'm looking at the 67 counties in alabama if i'm interested in uh, you know looking at all counties ordered by the um, change in cases, uh, then I can, anyway, there's all kinds of ways to interact here. I think, uh, in interest of time though, I'm, I'm going to just pivot back quickly, um, to, uh, an, an idea that, um, that we've been working on taking what we've developed and thinking, how can we go a step further and take aspects of this, including data standards, um, and build something that can benefit the general data community, as well as make apps like this more robust to deal with future events. So we've been working on something um, we're uh, calling the COVID-19 data registry. And actually what I just showed you in this application is based off of this framework that we've developed with the idea being, you know, people are gonna publish their public data however they wanna publish it, but that doesn't stop us from defining standards and schemas and providing transformers that pull from those sources, transform it to the way that our analysis or our app expects things to go. Um, and, we're, and we're doing this in an interesting way where we're using, um, all of this is self-contained in GitHub. We're using GitHub actions, um, GitHub repositories where the code and the data goes and all of the compute goes so that it hopefully is easy for a community to contribute to you're not reliant on outside compute resources and, and things like that. Um, I think that's all the time that I, I have. Um, so I'm happy to uh, you know, discuss this more with, with people who are interested. Uh, but I think there is some interesting potential future work around this framework of building schemas for different data types, pulling those in and augmenting our analyses and interfaces to deal with those. Um, and with that, uh, thanks for listening. And you know, if you're interested in following this uh, uh, effort or collaborating, feel free to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, now our third speaker. Um, our third speaker is uh, Dr. Orton Eigen. Orton is a senior researcher at the Environmental Systems Research Institute and a faculty member at the Spatial Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. He's also the product engineer for RBridge, a uh, geospatial R library that integrates R analysis with geographic information systems. He holds uh, a master's and a PhD from the Stanford School of Earth Sciences. So please welcome Dr. Iden. Thank you, Joe. Um, today, I would like to talk about the spatial and space-time aspect of COVID-19 and available data sources. I would like to start my talk by reflecting on the evolution of the media that is being used to study and communicate pandemics. On the left is an infographic from 1980s Spanish flu. Here, the main media were charts depicting the curve that we've been hearing so much about. Um, even though there were epidemics and pandemics between 1918 and 2009, I will quickly 
jump over to H1N1 swine flu pandemic. Um, and we start seeing more common uses of maps to communicate information to the public. Now, I'm not here making a statement saying that in the past, people never used cartography to map diseases. This has been done for, uh, for a very long time. But what I'm uh, pointing out here is uh, more and more we are using maps to communicate information related to pandemics uh, to everybody um, so that they can, uh, they, can they can be knowledgeable about what is going on. And lastly, we have the JHU dashboard that I'm confident that most of you have seen uh, and previous speakers have also talked about uh, for COVID-19 on the right-hand side, um, which is an interactive map that contains rich information, both in space and in time. So this is a spatio-temporal data source. Um, and unlike a static image, a static map, um, this is a dashboard that you can interact with uh, to look at parameters that you're interested in, to look at temporal evolution, to look at time series at a given location. Um, this evolution points to a certain fact that uh, two of which is one, growing importance of spatial and spatiotemporal data and its analysis in a planet that is more connected than ever, and the immense value in sharing data in a format that is actionable. And when we talk about creating maps like these, uh, we can talk about five main steps. Of course, we can break this down further, but these main steps is first mapping the cases. Here, data that is being collected by local international authorities, firstly, this data needs to be curated, cleaned, and put in a format um, that allows mapping it. Um, this process involves um, projections, uh, cartography, and finally mapping the data in a digital form that can be shared with everybody. Of course, the raw data is really actionable, even though it can, it can be very useful for understanding what is going on. In the case of COVID-19, we need to represent temporal information in a way that can, so that we can map the spread of this disease. Here, the time component in the data has utmost importance when we are mapping the spread. In addition to raw data, here we can also think about model data outputs, such as uh, EPI models that uh, Allison talked about initially. Um, being able to map these in space and time gives us an idea about how the pandemic might progress as time goes along. Certain demographics are more vulnerable than others, and uh, we are aware of that. In this stage, in addition to risk uh, mapping the cases and the spread, mapping vulnerable populations becomes very important and creating risk maps are very important for um, decision makers, that both at the international and local level. And we know that a pandemic creates a heavy load for hospital resources, such as medical, for medical professionals, hospital beds, ICUs, ventilators, just to name a few. In addition, this has a very deep impact for our supply pipelines as well, the way we get our goods um, and the global economy. So being able to map these available resources, being able to map what is at stake, being able to map shortages becomes very important. And this fourth step, mapping available resources and combining with um, mapping the spread and future projections become very important. And last but definitely not least is the communication portion of it, where we communicate the current status of the pandemic with everybody. Of course, all of these steps rely on data. And of course, there are some challenges related to data. The first and foremost being uncertainty. Uh, case data, for example, has uncertainty associated with it. As, and of course, as the spatial extent of this data increases from a hospital level, to a county level, to a country level, um, we see that the uncertainty on this data also increases. Um, sometimes this is due to reports, uh, some um, measurements errors, some uh, mistakes during reporting or systematic data suppression. Secondly, COVID-19 also impacts us on many aspects of our lives. Data pertaining to these, uh, such as hospital resources, trade flows, employment, comes at different scales both temporally and spatiotemporally. So being able to resolve these different scales in data is also a very important uh, challenge um, going forward. Representing data spatially and temporally, um, again, is a crucial step. Um, as I said, the impact of the pandemic on our society and its progression is a spatiotemporal phenomena. Um, being able to represent the data in a spatial temporal format that we all can use um, through data aggregation and spatial temporal representation is key. In addition to uh, challenges with scale, some of the data 
on the impacts of COVID-19 comes in different formats, such as tweets, uh, proximity recorded by cell phones. Um, and here, resolving these different types of data is quite important to be able to use them in conjunction with a, uh, with a uh, multidisciplinary, within a multidisciplinary model. Lastly, the pandemic and its impact on our lives is evolving, and this necessitates the ability to serve and consume data in real time, because the data here is dynamic. Um, not casting, short casting is as important as a forecast, is at least as important as forecasting. So being able to make short term forecasts as well. Um, so here, curating, serving uh, this live data becomes quite challenging because we know how challenging it is to curate data on its own. Um, but now that we're dealing with live data, um, dynamic data sources, how can we curate those uh, so that we can serve them on real time, which is uh, what is needed at this point. I would like to delve into some data requirements. Um, I think we had a great overall view of epidemiological models. Here, these models are being frequently used to uh, understand the progression of the pandemic um, and what the future numbers are going to be. Uh, these no models are particularly useful to port, uh, forecast the progression and also modeling the impact of interventions. Um, data on population, demographics is particularly important to model the susceptible population. Um, and spread of the infection is modeled with different metrics, such as the attack rates, the infection rates. Um, also important are the dynamic information on the progression of the infection. Um, in particular, the timelines of incubation, infections, and convalescence. And of course, if you want to create a regional model, you need to have this data at the regional scale, or at least the spatial units at which this region is discretized on. And some models require data on hospitalizations, a number of COVID-19 patients coming in, the death rate um, among hospitalized patients, their length of stay at the hospital, and possible length of use of ventilators and stay at the ICU. Uh, and this data is, is also, uh, has some uncertainty associated with it. It is incomplete, um, but this is an important aspect of the data that we need for these models. And on the intervention side, we need data on the intervention type and its effectiveness um, on the rate of growth of the infection. Of course, this is very hard to gauge, and we use secondary uh, sources to be, to be able to do that at a large geographic scale. That, that has some uncertainty associated with it, um, but this is, again, a required input for uh, the EPI models. So these models predict the demand on hospital resources, and we need some data on available resources so that we can plan for allocation of these um, limited resources. One thing we do not want to have are shortages. If a COVID-19 patient cannot get the care they need due to lack of staff beds, ICUs, or ventilators, the death rate can go up uh, quite, quite sharply. And because the population now cannot be, a part of the population who is infected cannot be treated. So in addition to hospital resources needed by patients, there are resources that are needed by medical professionals, such as PPEs, uh, personal protection equipment. And um, having resources for these is extremely important as well. And this is a data that we need to have uh, to plan as, um, as this pandemic progresses. Um, protective equipments are things such as gloves, masks, and gowns that are generally in short supply, that can, that can be in short supply, and these can limit the number of active professionals treating patients or cause uh, more health professionals to get infected while treating uh, this virus. Um, bed, ICU, and ventilator data is reported by hospitals, and authoritative spatial data on these exists. But of course, the temporal aspect of this data is still lagging. We do not know how these numbers are changing day by day, um, especially not, in, uh, not at a county level. Um, we do not have this type of resolution yet. And also, PPEs are a very unique supply chain challenge where we need data about source, the transport, and the destination of these materials so that we can plan accordingly to make sure that healthcare professionals have the equipments they need. So we have been compiling geospatial resources, data resources, and there's a link for our uh, disaster response hub at ESRI. You can access data that is live, uh, that is curated, um, and also is served through RESTful APIs. So if you are using R or Python, you can directly bring this data in, and this is freely available. Um, for you to use. Um, so you can actually start consuming this data in your analysis if you're interested. Um, there's a wide breadth of data here. Um, we compile data from uh, sources such as Facebook for Good, mobility data, um, GHU data, 
Um, and the map that you, the dashboard that you see is an Esri dashboard. So it is being served on our technology. Um, and also the layers for, uh, for those data sources are available for you to use. Um, so on the data required, so moving away from the raw data side or, and the data required, there is also an important aspect that is communicating this data. The data doesn't need to be raw data, this can be model data, and it is very important to be able to communicate this data because we know that communication is a huge aspect of this. Um, one thing we have done within the spatial statistics team at ESRI was integrating some of these models that are out there. Um, an example of which you have seen, so this definitely is not an exhaustive list of epi models that are out there. Um, one from um, University of Penn is called CHIME, the other one is the IHME model and also the COVID-19 surge model from CDC. Um, one thing that we've, that we've done, um, and I do not wanna to go too much into the modeling details because some of these um, required re-implementing them so that we can integrate them into the platform. But uh, the idea here was taking these models that are not spatial, but that can make pr projections and over time and integrating inside a geographic framework so that we can bring together the demand and the resources together to understand if shortages are going to occur. And here is an example of a web widget we created using the CHIME model. Here we are modeling at, in Florida at the county level what the demand for hospital resources is going to be. And when we overlay this with hospital resources, now we will have an idea of overages. And here we are comparing two scenarios in orange, 29 per, um, in orange is a social distancing of 29% effectiveness and a social distancing of 50% effectiveness on reducing the infection rate. So at some point, you will see that a case where we do not have as much social distancing, the hospital resources here at this time in this model starts running over. And you can see on the left hand side, uh, in real time, what, uh, which locations are going to be impacted and where the overages are going to be. Since, these, um, since this is integrated within a GIS, you can have this broader view of how things change over space and time, which makes it very important to plan for these extreme events. In addition to communicating modeled and raw data, um, I, as I mentioned, you can consume the live data that you serve through the use of APIs. Um, and this being jointly organized by our consortium, I will be remiss if I did not mention the excellent geospatial libraries in R that you can leverage for um, reading, processing, and working with live geospatial and spatiotemporal data. And here I would like to highlight the open source GeoJSON R package, which allows you to bring in data that's in GeoJSON format into R as a data frame. And also I would like to highlight the ArcGIS binding as we call the R bridge, which is an R package that we develop at ESRI that allows you to seamlessly read in all the data sources I mentioned so far um, as an R data frame so that you can integrate this into your analysis. And I would like to show you very quickly uh, what this looks like. And I would like to do so using an R notebook um, and here, one thing I wanted to show you is since this data is live, meaning that more and more uh, data sources is coming in over time at spatial units, whenever you run this analysis, it's gonna be a different answer. And you may not need data from certain counties or from certain timelines. So this has the advantage of not downloading files um, over and over, even though they might be updated regularly so that you can just get the portion of it that you need. Um, so I have this live data source that is um, actually the county level data from JHU of cases over time for US counties. Here I can uh, point to this remote data source. I can bring in only a portion of the data over California that I need so that I don't have to bring in the whole data set. I can also sub subset this temporally and I can start um, basically bringing, it, bringing this in as a geospatial data frame and start, um, start analyzing it. I can even uh, start serving this as an interactive plot E map. So this allows me to create widgets. This allows me to bring data in for my own analysis so that I can really truly stand on the shoulders of giants here and um, leverage our libraries to do my analysis. And I would like to conclude by the challenges here. 
Um, here, resolving different scales is a big challenge, both at spatial and temporal uh, levels. This is something that we definitely need to address for different data sources. Um, representing uncertainty in data and models is crucial. We know that these data sources have uncertainty associated with them, and they definitely should be a part of the data itself and also the metadata that anybody, a practitioner, uh, needs to know that the data that you're using has uncertainty associated with it. And lastly, community-driven curation. We want to make sure that we enable high-fidelity data and um, Doing this for live data is challenging, but that is definitely a challenge that we need to face now uh, during this crisis where every, every day counts. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're doing pretty good with time, but let's get to our last speaker, Dr. Noam Ross. Noam is a principal scientist for computational research at EcoHealth Alliance. He studies how the combined process of changing wildlife populations, evolution of pathogens, and human activity lead to the emergence and spread of disease. His work focuses on understanding disease in complex structured populations and on developing epidemiological forecasting. Noam is also part of the leadership of R Open Sci, an organization that develops tools and communities to foster reproducibility and open science among researchers. Please welcome Dr. Ross. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so thanks for the organizers uh, for putting together this forum and uh, all of the other speakers who have said great things and everyone coming to attend. If this is the beginning of a series of forums, I think we're off to a great start. Um, in highlighting the issues and helping us all come to a better understanding of uh, what we need to do to get a better picture of COVID-19 through the data and uh, use that data to, uh, you know, intervene and uh, support policy and action and healthcare. Again, my name's Noam Ross. I work for an organization called EcoHealth Alliance. EcoHealth Alliance is a nonprofit based in New York. We work at the intersection of wildlife conservation and human health. And a very large part of that is studying the emergence of new diseases from wildlife populations, how they spill over into humans and how they spread in the human population. And it's a group that ranges from veterinary scientists to medical anthropologists, to data scientists and computational researchers like myself, as well as virologists and public policy specialists. Mm -hmm. uh, so we work very much at this, at this intersection um, and have been involved in coronavirus work for many years. Uh, and, as, and as Joe said, I also work for an organization called R Open Sci. R Open Sci builds sort of both the technical and the community infrastructure, especially within the R language, but to support open and reproducible science. And these are these, the two directions from which I come at uh, COVID-19 data problems. Uh, on one hand, the studying of the emergence of the virus. On the other hand, uh, the practice and understanding of data sharing and curation and communities. And then my original training is in the type of mathematical epidemiology that uh, Allison Hill described at the, at the beginning of these talks. Um, and, you know, everyone at EcoHealth as well myself is involved in some form of that uh, response work and consulting with and advising with policymakers uh, including building models with this type of data that is uh, being brought and collected by people from all around the world. So what I thought I would talk about a bit today, uh, because of the nature of the forum and the discussions we're hoping to have, is I'm going to go back to the beginning and talk a little about the nature of the data that helps us understand the emergence of an epidemic like this, uh, which is sort of the, the data world I know best, and the challenges and successes within that and then apply it to the data we're seeing in the epidemiological context as more and more sources are coming online and uh, all we have all these challenges in building data and tools for epidemiological response. One of the interesting things about this epidemic is actually how much we've learned about the viral origins of it very quickly. So, 
SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, uh, was only discovered when it emerged in January. And we know a whole lot about it, um, and even a lot that we learned within the first few weeks because of the research that occurred very rapidly. We don't know completely everything about its origins, but we know a lot about where it lives within the evolutionary tree of viruses and its closest relatives. Um, within the first few weeks of its discovery, uh, a preprint and then a paper and then follow-up papers had analyzed the viral sequence, published the viral sequence, compared it to other viral sequences, and helped us understand that it most likely originated or is derived from viruses that circulate within bat populations in southern China. So uh, a couple of the papers that do that analysis are on this slide and on the left is an evolutionary tree that shows where samples of the uh, SARS-CoV virus uh, back before it was named to when it was the novel coronavirus um, nest within this group of SARS-like coronaviruses that had been sampled from bats and are very closely related to a particular sample uh, that came from a, a bat from Yunnan province. Uh, so this occurred very rapidly and that's actually quite a bit of contrast from uh, how we learned about viruses in the past. If you go back to the Ebola epidemic, just getting the first sequence out of the first Ebola epidemic in West Africa took uh, a number of months. And actually, when you go back to uh, the original uh, SARS outbreak in the early 2000s, uh, while there, were a, there was a bunch of work that occurred quickly, really understanding and pinpointing the origin you know, has taken uh, more than a decade to understand that. And so uh, there's this rapidity with which understanding viral relationships and disease origins is beginning to happen that we've seen in this, uh, uh, this outbreak. And one of the things that uh, is the driver of that is not just the investment in wildlife surveillance, sort of the increasing uh, focus in the field following the first SARS outbreak, but it's been the development and widespread use of common genetic data repositories. So there are a number of these repositories, two of which are really most important in my work. One run by the NIH called GenBank and an international one called GIS Aid, which stands for the, uh, um, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it wrong. Um, uh, general, uh, the Global Initiative to Share All Influenza Data. So it originated as an influenza focused repository but then, ex but then ex uh, expanded to uh, cover many other viruses and sequences. And because genetic data follows something of a common format, there's obviously complexities to it, but genetic sequences are similar data and the very widespread common practices within genetic fields of publicly depositing data from scientific research, there are very large banks of genetic data that can be commonly compared and can be drawn upon for when you have the discovery of new viruses to see what they relate to and to see how they relate to how they relate to each other, what are likely causes of origin, what are similar viruses that one might use in order to uh, test potential uh, treatments and understand cellular mechanisms better. And having all of that data available in those banks is really one of the reasons you're able to make these comparisons quickly and learn a lot about viruses from sequences. It's not just the sequence that you have, it's all of the sequences out there you have to compare to. And uh, it's really a testament to the value of the sharing of that common open data. So this is useful in sort of understanding origins, it's useful in researching and understanding molecular mechanisms of how viruses work. But because of the extent and the widespread use of uh, especially GIS ID during this epidemic, it's also useful for real-time analytics. And one example of that that I'm showing you here is a fantastic uh, tool called NextStrain. There's a great group that runs NextStrain. And NextStrain, again, starting um, from a base of influenza and now working through all sorts of other uh, viral epidemics, does the work of pulling all of that data from GISAID and are running phylogenetic models so you can understand the relationship 
between different lineages of the viruses. And when that data is combined with geographic metadata about viruses, you get real-time insights about the, the movement of viral lineages around the world. And that's how we understand, for instance, that the first cases in Washington originated from Asia and then there was community spread because cases were linked there or that cases in New York are more likely to have originated in Europe than to have uh, originated in Asia. So the existence of these repositories, which carry standardized data of sort of a narrow type, but a common format enables sort of real time comparison and a real time use of this data as it comes online and the existing previously built up infrastructure for sharing that data, for having common standards and metadata and linking is what enables these platforms to be built on top of it. And one of the real great legacies for investment. So this type of thing is extremely useful in our work in identifying viruses, but it's only one side of the picture and other areas aren't as well standardized. So. One of the things I work in is understanding where the viral populations are that can potentially pose risks to human, humans. You need to know not just things about viral sequences, but you have to know things about the hosts or the animals that house those viruses as well. And so you need standardized information about biodiversity, about species locations and species populations. And there are uh, targeted repositories for that type of information. Uh, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility is a very common and broadly used one, um, and VertNet specific to vertebrates. And then sort of to the right, the KNB repository gives you a lot of this data in less standardized form. As you go from left to right, you get into a bit more of a sort of a wild west where you have standardized metadata, but very different types of data. And then you need the information that links those things together, uh, which gives you information about host pathogen interactions. And that's something that there is not really a very widespread common data standard about how uh, to link these two types of data. So individual projects, such as on the left here, a project that I've worked on called PREDICT, uh, which uh, does viral sampling globally has its own. Here's the linkage between an animal species location and a viral detection. There are sort of literature diving databases like the Global Mammal Parasite Database or GLOBI, the Global Database of Biotic Interactions. And as you get into this more and more detail of linking different types of standardized data, there becomes less and less of a common language. And one of the challenges of not having that common language is you lose a lot of information when you try to link information together. So when you have information about viruses and information about hosts and you're trying to construct information about their linkages, their interactions, you realize there are a lot of parts of that linkage or interaction that you have to consider that are not binary. So there might be um, you know, just the detection, the presence or absence of data being there, uh, but it may be more complex. Maybe you've detected that relationship because of seroprevalence and antibodies, which is weaker evidence than getting tighter a virus itself. Maybe there are different types of tests you use, you use for it. Maybe you know more about the prevalence in that animal population rather than just its presence. And all of those types of information are the types of information often you lose when you try to link these different types of data because you sort of need to go to a lowest common denominator to have databases speak to each other in a common language. And this is all before we get to the next stage of how are these animal populations and viral populations interacting with humans through their, uh, through contact with domestic animals, through human behaviors, uh, through land use change, through things like that. And so this is the biggest gap that I tend to work on, just trying to figure out how to link these data together. And it's the perspective I've brought as I've moved to more and more of the epidemiological work uh, in uh, COVID-19. So many of the speakers who have uh, uh, gone before me have already sort of talked a lot about case counts and death counts and the type of common epidemiological data that sort of forms the baseline information of our picture of the pandemic. 
So in the United States context, at least, we have um, largely sort of state level and some federal level reporting of these basic pieces of information. Where are the cases? How many cases are there? Who, how many tests have there been? How many deaths have there been? In some cases, how much hospitalization has there been? Uh, these are largely coming out in the US from state agencies, be it uh, state departments of health, state governor's offices. Um, and there's a lot of heterogeneity in how these things are reported. And our previous speakers have all spoken to the challenges of pulling this information together in various ways. Uh, so this is sort of the baseline common information that with the degree of common vocabulary and common dictionary we can use to draw a picture of, of the epidemic in localities and then across localities. One of the observations I've had of this type of data is that there's a really kind of a mixed record so far of the state and local governments making use of the open data infrastructure that they themselves have built in the past. So lots of municipalities and states have open data platforms specifically for reporting data and dealing with provenance issues, dealing with versioning, providing data via APIs. There's been a great movement for open government, open, open data in the past decade or so. Um, but only if in a few cases are these platforms how governments are serving this data that's of sudden importance. I was looking at New York City, I was looking at Minnesota and searching their open data platforms. Are they using them to, to talk about coronavirus or COVID or virus? And in most cases, you don't get results. It'll different in California. The California data portal is using it. And that's not to say this is the correct way to do it. Uh, obviously, the data platforms were built for specific purposes, and the data that's coming in for uh, COVID um, is different in a lot of ways in terms of the speed at which it's coming in, the type of audience that it has, its structure, than many of the things that people have uh, sort of anticipated for these portals. But it means that a lot of the capacities that these were built for aren't immediately available and there's a degree of reinventing the wheel in reporting this, this data given that these capacities exist. So as a result, a lot of the data that people use, and we've seen this a lot, comes through the sort of aggregation and standardization projects that have emerged very rapidly. So uh, some of these we discussed already and seen, such as the uh, John Hopkins plat platform. One of the interesting things is the degree to which these have been driven by journalistic organizations. So the New York Times and uh, the Atlantic, both in the US, are a couple of sort of the uh, fastest sources that developed for this. And you know the, the data journalism infrastructure that has come up in recent years has really proven very uh, capable of handling this particular challenge of rapidly developing an interface and a process for a, for a new data source. You know, whether it's the best platform for an ongoing basis, we don't know, but these tracking projects have become really core to how a lot of different groups have worked. So that's sort of this one set of common baseline case data, death data, hospitalization data, the picture of the pandemic. So I think of that as the genetic data of epidemiolo epidemiology. This is what, this is the backbone of what it is. But then there are these other things that come in, uh, which sort of, you know, Dr. Hill, for instance, described as important for modelers to use. Um, so one of those is mobility data, uh, uh, a common uh, theme in this pandemic has been social distancing and how the mobility of people, their movement, their contact is very important in as a, a, a mechanism for controlling the disease and measuring that is a mechanism for understanding transmission of the disease. So there have been a number of sources that have been openly published, which are aggregations of cell phone data. So both Google and Apple have public sources in which they are publishing what are sort of anonymous aggregated versions of whatever large troves of cell phone mobility data they have. And then there are a number of sources uh, that provide that at a much more granular level. And usually those require some level of agreement. They're not just openly published, although uh, various parts of them are. So 
the uh, Cubic group. Uh, a lot of their work has been used in data journalism and researchers use that quite often. The Safe Graph uh, organization also uh, has been making uh, cell phone data available for people to use using these previously commercial applications and making those available to researchers. And that's another strand of data coming into understanding this system. And that's just a small part. Uh, again, Dr. Hill talked a lot about all of the different things that modelers need to know and the types of things that we run into. So there have been a number of initiatives that try to aggregate the estimates of those models and the parameters that you might use. Within the NIH, there's something called the MIDAS network, the Modeling Infectious Disease Network, and uh, they collect parameter estimates from lots of different studies together. There's another group at the University of Georgia that does the same. So when measuring how many people who get the virus get sick with what symptoms? How many have no symptoms? How long does it take someone who gets the virus to show up to the hospital if they do show up to the hospital? How long do they stay in the hospital? There are all these different both modeling and clinical studies that have estimated these values that are then important to be passed on for future model or future capacity and policy decisions. And those are being aggregated in a certain way. And with thousands and thousands of papers being published that do this kind of thing, uh, there have been new approaches to this. So uh, the US uh, uh, Office of Technology Policy, along with Kaggle, had put together a natural language processing challenge to try to extract as many of these as possible. So these are some of the strands of data that come together, especially for the type of modeling that, that I've been doing. And I just wanted to end on some observations about what's happening as people are trying to pull all these things together. One, we've heard a lot about the aggregation and standardization of these data so people can have big picture uh, understanding. But the more we aggregate and standardize data, the more we lose in the useful data and grain of local and finer demographic detail, which is harder to pass, pass between databases. And one of the biggest issues is trying to understand how to link these very different types of sources. So for instance, if I'm doing something that uses a bunch of different geographic sources of case data, can I link that so that the parameters that I pull out from one of the model parameter bases matches that geography or those, de or those demographics or that component of the virus? And then finally, the policy questions that are relevant are changing really rapidly. What people need to know at the beginning of an outbreak as cases are rising is different than what they need to know at a peak or a plateau or as people are trying to implement long-term policy decisions. And that um, progression is very different in different places. The type of questions that certain people are asking of me from South America are the ones that people were asking in different parts of the world six weeks ago. And so what the policy questions are should really drive what our data and modeling projects are. And I'll just point you to a really great paper uh, from a group at Georgetown that summarized the questions that policymakers are asking of modelers and data scientists these days. Um, so we can use those to focus the type of work that we do. Thank you, Noam. Thank you. All right. Thank you and thank all our speakers. I uh, think now we have some time for questions. Uh, so Michael, please um, lead us through that. Sure. All right, so um, I'm gonna go back, uh, ask a question. It'll be kind of directed at one of the speakers, but other people are, other speakers are wel uh, welcome to give their perspective. Uh, the first one's for Allison, um, and this comes from, from the audience. It's for transmission networks, uh, which, you, which you talked about. How many different types of networks would you expect to track? I guess the different networks might be more or less conducive to spreading a virus. Can you give an example of different networks having different characteristics? Yeah, sure. No, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, in general, there's always this trade-off in models between keeping things simple enough that you can really understand your outputs and how your assumptions impact them um, versus including like as much realistic detail as we can. And that is a huge concern when thinking about transmission networks. So um, I think that, uh, you know, sometimes we try to capture just certain statistical features of networks. So like the average and the variance in the um, number of contacts people have 
over a certain time period. Other times you try to include more detail about the nature of those contexts. So like some of the images that they showed in my talk were from studies where they try to separate out contacts into different types. So people you contact in your household, at work, at school, in social settings, and, and maybe just like random other people in your um, town or city. Uh, and those networks all have different statistical features. Some are characterized by really high levels of interconnectedness, um, like households and social groups often like that, workplaces. Other types of networks are um, sort of much more similar to like random networks that you study in statistics. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the context. And of course, you know, those networks do have different features in terms of how likely they are to involve the type of contact that might be relevant for different diseases. So, you know, for example, like in my day job, I study HIV. And for HIV, people think a lot about sexual contact networks, which have very different statistical features um, than household networks or um, workplace networks. And so that's why we need to understand the, the biology of how diseases are transmitted to understand um, how important these different networks might be um, for, for transmission. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, all right, the next question uh, is gonna be for, for Ryan. So this idea of using uh, GitHub and GitHub Actions for um, kind of aggregating data and then also joining data uh, is a pretty interesting one since you kind of all agree on, so you, there's kind of an implicit agreement on the platform being used to, to aggregate the data and then also how it's being validated. Can you talk about the, the generalizability of that and kind of what are, what do you think the hurdles to that become? Is it, does it become data size or is it, you know, the sophistication of the user or is this really something we should all be thinking about as, as we're trying to um, aggregate uh, data sets from disparate sources? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, you know, there, there are a lot of aspects of, um, you, you know, the, 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 the reason we chose this approach and some of, you know, uh, we've been constrained to data that is um, not very large in size and also data that is open, right? And you do run into challenges when you get into uh, different structured data or different, um, you know, uh, unique environments required to, to process the data. Um, but the, the main the main goal behind the, or the main I think thing that drove us to the idea of using GitHub was just the notion of um, when you are trying to pull data together from many sources. And I, I did see a question kind of related to this about you know why is not everybody using the same uh, platform to share their data? And I I I think you know the answer is you've got hundreds of countries and within those countries, different states and everybody, you know, Noam kind of touched on this. You, everybody has different, um, uh, different platforms they've invested in, different ways of doing things. And you really can't force people to conform regardless of what, you know, body you are. And, and anyway, so what I'm getting at is the, the, the reason we kind of just lean toward GitHub was the idea of, you know, this is the least amount of friction and it's very open. And hopefully it's a system where you can scale and use, you know, a crowd of people who all come from the different areas where this data is being published, where maybe, you know, the, the, um, the organizations are not doing, uh, ad adhering the standards, but scientists can help get their data into the standards in a, in a very kind of open and collaborative way. Um. Okay, thanks. All right, the next question is for Oren. Uh, collecting data on some resources, resources and usage can be more human intensive than others. Are there ways we should be thinking about automating the things like the inventory for, the, for these types of resources? Um, definitely. So. Um, for inventory, automating it definitely makes sense, and this come this can come through um, connected sensors, and this can be easily done. Um, it has been done for, it has been done by um, retailers for a long time now uh, to optimize their um, to optimize their pipelines. So this can this definitely should have been done, and definitely could have, could be done. Um, I don't know if it will be done, especially on time. Um, 
but um, so to answer that, definitely yes. But then there are um, there are other factors that it's just really hard to measure um, with a sensor. So for those, we rely on proxies. Um, for example, the effectiveness of a social distancing measure that's been passed. Uh, some people try to use um, satellite images, traffic data. Um, there are different sources, and there we are really relying on um, a proxy. Um, we can extract information from the proxy, but then we also need an uncertainty model that can tie that proxy to the actual parameter that we are interested in. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, now for GNOME, uh, our open side is a great job creating an ecosystem for peer reviewed software tools for analyzing data. Is there a good way to extend this to data processing analysis, uh, aggregation, uh, and interactive sub summaries, not just those in publication? I, I wonder if this question has been uh, planted. Um, we have a new initiative that's actually starting up right now. Our open sci, uh, uh, as the questioner said, we have a, a peer review process for uh, uh, for code and for code in R for R packages um, in sort of the data management lifecycle. So people uh, who build tools that help people manage data, especially scientific data, um, can submit their packages to be reviewed and get feedback and sort of get a stamp of approval. Um, and we have uh, shied away over the years from doing this uh, specifically for like statistical algorithms and a bunch of the things that people use but require a different type of expertise, not just a software engineering expertise, but uh, statistical and mathematical expertise. But we are expanding that right now. Um, I will drop a, um, a link into the chat about um, sort of our initial research project and doing that because we are building a um, sort of a new review board and new editorial process and a new set of standards so people can have uh, their data and that their data analysis tools and not just their sort of management tools uh, be reviewed uh, in that way. Uh, so, um, and we're thinking about how, you know, the degree to which like, you know, a data, data summary type um, type tools can fit into that as well as your, your model fitting tools and your machine learning approaches and things like that. Okay, thanks. Uh, I guess, Joe, is it, uh, are we, we have ready time for, for maybe remarks? one more question? Okay, there was, there was a really nice one uh, that I liked. That I liked. It, so this is for all, for all the speakers. It's, are there any resources, funding, talent, matching, et cetera, for people who have the skill set and interest to help with data collection, design, data cleaning, best practices, or research design? I find it frustrating to see most resources go towards data mining and modeling, example, hackathons. Being in the private sector and living in Portland with where grassroots movements such as volunteer mutual aid networks are vibrant, I really want to be able to collect data on vulnerable populations, available resources, and share them with, resor with researchers. However, I don't know how to get involved uh, with, with interested resource, uh, researchers. Um, so Allison, do you want to do you want to go first? Do you have, or are there are there suggestions where people are like, I need to tell you this now? <laughs> or go ahead, Allison. Just one second. I was just typing an answer to another question. Um, sure. I mean, that's a great question, and I don't really have a good answer. Um, I think that yeah, somehow part of the problem. I mean, grassroots efforts are, are great, but part of the problem is it's just hard for people to like find things and connect with them. And it would be great if there were sort of some more official efforts to like bring people together on um, on projects. That they, but yeah, I, I don't know that there's like one easy way to find kind of the best group to reach out with. I mean, I would say if you're in the private sector and you have like free time on your hands to do this, like try to find some um, university groups, for example, that are working on these type of questions and just email them and like offer to help out. I think everyone's stretched really thin and definitely appreciate efforts from um, people with with experience in, in these type of issues. Um, and I think just like, I mean, that that's happened to me. I mean, when I first made this simulator app, a lot of people just got in touch and were like, hey, this is cool. Like we're interested in helping um, with with modeling efforts, like how can we do that? And just, you know, ended up bringing some people in. So, so that's one option, but I don't have a great answer to that. 
Okay. Thank you. We're, we're uh, almost out of time here. This last question, I think, deserves a, a lot more. And uh, I think that we will be able to pick that up in the future, especially as we get involvement from um, the public health officials who are uh, particularly overwhelmed at this time, but uh, we'll be looking for ideas uh, along those lines. So thank, thank you all of the speakers. Uh, I think you've done a marvelous job of um, talking about the uncertainty with fundamental data collection, the complexity, the immensity, the kinds of diversity in data that's needed. And, and I, think, um, I think we all have a better overview of where we stand now as a, um, as a community. So this wraps up the, um, the forum for today. We, are, uh, rec we have recorded this. It, the recordings will be available as soon as we can make it happen on the uh, conference uh, website. That's covid19-data-forum-org. And please look for us both on uh, Twitter and um, on Stanford and our consortium um, news. So thank you all. And um, that's all for today.